Well, let's make sure it keeps going good. Okay. So domination and power. Um, are we good on the domination definition? I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. So the power is just the ability to influence people um, in any way, even if it's good or bad, right? So whether it's um, influencing people to go march for black lives or whether it's to influence people, you know, to storm the Capitol, um, whichever, <laughs> wherever it goes. So um, the normal <laughs> average everyday life of a person isn't going to involve marching and or rioting, right? And so someone had power to influence people to do that. Now, when we talk about domination, there is, he will describe legitimate and illegitimate domination. But remember, it's based, he's interested in interpretation and meaning. So legitimate domination is um, obedience that is freely given on the basis of some social meaning okay so and we'll describe why so at the very basic it's commands that are obeyed without physical force or threats of force and it's legitimate because people allow it to be there illegitimate domination would be something akin to slavery it would, or um, dictatorships or things in which people are not just commanded but also threatened or physically forced into doing something so, Professor, how do we how do we understand the vaccine argument in 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 the context of what you just said? Okay, so the va which which vaccine argument? So the the one where people feel like it's it's an infringement upon their rights, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a good chunk of people who feel that this particular thing that the country is being asked to do is is infringing upon their rights so you know so and, and i understand that argument actually but what i'm getting at is what a which one of these is at play what's at play with right. that it would so um i i think Weber would say the united states government is having a crisis of legitimate power okay in that okay not all of their commands are being obeyed by the entire population. And we'll get into mm -hmm. why. I think this will be interesting to see what you think about when he gets into his ideal types. Um, okay. So one, before we get into that, one last definition. Discipline is um, a type of legitimate domination in which there is an ingrained attitude and an uncritical and unresistant, unresisting mass obedience. So um, this could be something like driving on the correct side of the road. None mm -hmm. of us are debating that. We might joke about it when we go to another country, but in our day-to-day -day lives, we are accepting the power of the government um, to tell us which side of the right, which side of the road to drive on. Right. So that would be discipline. Okay. So. When we get in our in the in what we're about to talk about is three again ideal types of legitimate domination. So they're um, willing acceptance of people having power over them. Okay, so the first is legal rational. The um, the legitimacy of a legal rational domination or authority is the is that the people have accepted the legal rules and framework and accepted the legality of how those frame or how those laws were enacted. They accept the power um, of those who are in office. And so obedience is given to the legal order or the office and not the person carrying out the orders or the or in the office. So one of the ways that I um describe this is with Trump, Biden, Obama, you know, these really, these three specifically, even more from my opinion than, you know, Bush, Reagan, Carter, um, and before that really divided the nation so that um, starting with Obama, there was many, many um, 
conservatives who would say things like, not my president, right? And often the response of Democrats at that time was not so much Obama's a good person, but Obama is president, respect the office, you don't have to respect the person, right? So it's trying to, um, ad- like, apl- uh, what's the word? Not apply. Um, it's a philosophy phrase. Um, appeal to the motivation or, or the um, meaning behind the laws, right? That he was duly elected. He's, it's legal. He is in power now. Accept that he is president. Give him respect because he's president, not because he's Obama, but because he's president. And the same thing happened on the reverse side when Trump was elected. A lot of the left was saying, oh, what a, you know, I don't respect him. He's not my president. And many on the right said he respect the office. Even if you don't respect the person, you've got to follow what Trump says because he's president. Um, now, I think, um, John C., this might help a little bit. The only way that this kind of authority is um, legitimate domination is when the people being ruled accept the legality of how that rule was enacted. And there are many, on, for example, who dispute vaccine mandates who argue it's unconstitutional, right? They give legal reasoning for why they are not following it. Um, we could even say, even go deeper, that they um, don't believe that Biden was elected fairly, and thus anything that comes out of his administration is not um, legitimate, right? So that might be one way of thinking of the vaccine mandates. Um, so for each of these, I want you to think of two things. First, what is the claim to legitimacy in that ideal type. And so for this one, the claim of legitimacy is the is legality, um, is that the legal rules were set up um, fairly and like properly. And then second, where is obedience owed? And in this case, obedience is owed either to the office or to the legal order, irrespective of who is in office, right? Any questions on legal rational authority? Yes. So the question for me becomes, and and I'm actually getting sicker, Professor, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to hang much longer. I'm not feeling so hot. Right. But I do need to ask this. The, the question for me becomes, what did Weber say, or does he say, anything about us if we decide to embody that position like what i mean is we know that in the world there are some authoritarian countries Mm -hmm. where you have true authoritarian leaders Mm -hmm. and so the question for me is how how would weber see a person who say may be legally in a legal rational position as president of the United States. But what if then that individual maybe uh, decides to uh, take authority to uh, beyond what Weber's talking about? Yeah. So that would then change. So a couple of things it would, Is the change of that person's like is like so let's say we're thinking of the president and they're going beyond the scope of the legal rules is the so a I think Weber would be interested in is the population following him like does the mass still give him legitimacy and if so I think it, it will turn into a different ideal type of authority if the masses are not um following him that definitely means that it is no longer legitimate domination but it is forced right there because yeah if, if we all disagreed and said no we're not following but 
he was in command of the military, then he could force, you know, or by, at least by threat. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I was actually listening um, today about what's going on in Myanmar. And mm -hmm. in the, about a year ago was when they had the military coup. Um, yeah. And so between 2012 and 2021, was that 2021? There was a democracy. And so there was a legal, rational authority in place. Um, with the military coup, the people are uprising and there's guerrilla warfare and there is um, the military is squashing a lot of these rebellions. So it is changed from a legal, rational to a domination, you know, an illegitimate domination in which force is being applied. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's exactly where where I was trying to see if if he well apparently he could see that it would go that way. It could go that way. Yeah. And again, so these are ideal types he's using to describe possible ways of power, not that it's only this way. Um I think we'll see once we get to type 3 Trump and probably Obama definitely embodied um, charismatic as much as they embodied legal rational. Um, and he, what he wants us to do with the ideal types is use them as tools to compare how power is actually happening on the ground. He's not saying necessarily that these are the only ways legitimate power is exercised, but is it similar to one of these ideal types? Why or why not? And then use the ideal types as a tool for measuring situations like you described. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the second type that Weber argues is for an ideal type is traditional. The claim to legitimacy here is um, that traditions is legitimate either by virtue of simply, you know, being longstanding or um, good or divine, right? A lot of monarchies are based in um, a divine right. Um, obedience is owed to the person of, so remember for legal rational, obedience was owed to the office. In traditional authority, obedience is owed to the person as long as they act within the bounds of that accepted authority. So there's usually some kind of, you know, bounds that they have to agree to if they just start you know murdering a whole swath of people there might be an uprising then again i have a picture of the king of saudi arabia and they do all sorts of things and still are in are still are king um which probably is a con combination of legitimate authority of traditional authority with you know a group of followers and illegitimate authority in which they force or threaten other people to follow, right? So again, it can be both at the same time. So, um, but yes, traditional is usually, like the best examples are monarchies. I'm not too sure of any non-monarchical power relationships that are traditional. Um, we could think about like, uh, family, children, businesses, you know, like the father gives it to the son and the son gives it to the daughter, right? And keeps on going. Um, that might be traditional leadership. Um, but usually the prime example is monarchies. So the last one and the most complicated one is charismatic. So the legitimacy is based in the belief that the person has some extraordinary heroism, sanctity, or, you know, divine gift. So uh, Christ is one of, Weber uses Christ and Mohammed as two of the big examples. Um, Martin Luther King, Gandhi. Um, so instead of the, I, I should have here, so instead of this, it should be obedience is owed to the charisma or character. Oops, what happened there? What happened? Um, can you still see it? I can't see it. There it goes. Charisma or character. So, so you don't mean character in its um, 
you mean character the person. You don't mean character their character. I mean like the uh what is a good word for this? The um words are so important and they're so hard. The kind of the mythology of the person in a way. And I don't mean mythology as like saying that Christ had no real power. I'm not trying to say that he did or did not. But the what Weber would say is the obedience was given because people believed he was magical and believed he was divine, believed he could perform miracles. And if he was unable to prove that, then he would lose his following. And so... Well, but see, but, but that... that... That kind of flies in the face to me for some of the things like if we talk, let's use our presidents for, for mm -hmm. instance, and we talk about if we talk about President Trump, then that people, people still believed or, or was attracted to the charisma, even, even though it was kind of known that it wasn't even real. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm confused by that a little bit, you know, because I understood what you were saying in terms of Obama. I get, get what you mean about the char charisma and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But there's something else, it seems to me. Uh, I don't know. So I, I would say um, with Trump specifically and, and, and this is a, you know, a great research project. And I'm, I'm, I would be shocked if someone hasn't already, you know, done some analysis of the charismatic authority of Trump and the intricacies of that. I, I, I would say that you often saw um, along the right the idea that Trump was doing all he could and he was the best person for the job. It's just that the the deep state was so strong. And so when he didn't get his way, it was because of, you know, things out of his control, but he would, he was the best, if he, if he couldn't do it, no one can, right? So I still think that mythos about Trump was there. And I still think it is there. Um, even, well, I, even if it's just I, the way he speaks, right? He commands a crowd better than most. Uh, it, like, it, it's kind of remarkable at how well he's able to stir up a crowd. So even if it's not the belief that he can, or even if it's regardless of the evidence, people feel like he is powerful. People feel like he is their champion. They feel like he listen, right? There is something there that they are giving. There is some acceptance of who Trump is trying to portray that people are buying into. And so I would still say the obedience is still to the charisma. Um, even, it, and it, we'll get into as well um, gr how groups hold Power. So these are how individuals hold power over multiple people. Later on, we're going to talk about class status party, which is how groups of people have power in different domains. Um, and that might complicate this because, you know, there's also some people are following along with Trump simply because they want to, A, get conservative policies passed. B, you know, if they're elected official, they also want to get more elected. You know, they want to buy off of Trump's base. So there's um, other reasons why people might still be in that space, even if it's not necessarily, I believe in Trump as my, you know, political savior. Okay. Does that help at all? A little bit. I, I'm still puzzled. I, again, I, on this, that. this isn't to say that um, Trump either has or does not have charisma. Um, or that he has to have charisma or legal rational, um, or that it has to be one of the three. There might be something else there, right, that um, Weber didn't identify. So, um, well, he says it's an unstable type. It's <laughs> so very maybe unstable. That's it. <laughs> and in fact, that we may see be now, the answer. <laughs> we see now in Trump's cult is the problem of succession. 
um, which yeah. is right here. Um, first, let me just describe. So charisma, as you mentioned, is the most unstable. Um, it has specific differences between um, the traditional and the legal rational. Char charismatic communities are generally, and he, he says not always, but generally um, avoidant of economic pursuits. So they're more likely to be communistic or socialistic, like share everything in common. Um, and they're, they are not likely to have a, like a whole bureaucratic, you know, s staff of people who make things function. Generally the, the, the close followers, um, share in the same kind of charisma that the leader does. So if we think again about, um, uh, and I'm, and I hope people realize that when I bring in religion and examples of Christ, it's only because I know more about that. And it's not saying that, look, we can explain away your religion based on sociology. I'm not trying to demean any religion. I'm just trying to use Weber's analysis here. So if we go back to um, thinking about Christ, Weber would say his followers, so the 12 apostles, you know, his staff, so to speak, also performed miracles. Um, and so they were also like, it's kind of like they were borrowing from Christ's charisma. And um, other examples that Weber gives are um, when you have berserkers, um, if you're familiar with like the history of war, berserkers um, would be like the, the most extreme um, uh, warriors who would follow the commander in battle, but they would just go raging in without any, like, you know, they, they wouldn't really be doing anything, but trying to be as strong and heroic as possible. So again, trying to feed off any like hero, heroic charisma, that would be another kind of like a leader in a charismatic movement. So they borrow from the magical powers, so to speak, of that, um, leader. And we see this so bringing it back to Trump, we see that most of the people who are trying to gain favor for Trump try to act like him, right? There's a very much of we have to talk like him. We have to, you know, talk about other people like he does. We have to say the same things he does. Otherwise, we won't have that power. So we definitely just we definitely see them trying to pull from that charisma as well. So charisma is inherently unstable because a the leader always has to be demonstrating the special powers if the authority is given to the power instead of to the person then the second the power is taken away then that charisma or that leader loses their authority um, and this is one reason why i think trump still has charisma and it's outside of um being i i I think it's I think it's it might be something to do less with his ability to enact change in government and more his ability to stir up emotions in people or things like that. And that might be the source of his charisma. He still has that power. Somehow he still has that power. Right. So he is. Well, Professor, yeah. but I, I want to ask one thing, mm -hmm. whether it's whether it's former President Trump or any former president or anybody in authority, where where do you put in the the dishonesty? Because I think that's what makes it the charisma kind of. I mean, if you don't know that someone's lying to you yet, <laughs> if you haven't figured that out yet, then you might. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's going to yeah. happen when they figure out that is there's a whole lot of mistruth. Here. I would recommend the essay by a philosopher whose name I can't remember, but the title of the essay <laughs> is called On Bullshit. And it Oh is, yeah, that's that's what I need. Yeah. It is <laughs> he describes the art of bullshitting and how it's very different than lying. It's very Oh, different. okay. It's different than lying. The whole idea is just to like rage out words in ways that are impossible to like define and clarify <laughs> and thus disprove. And I think that would be, so maybe Trump's charisma is the, his power is bullshitting. Um, right. And it might be right. And so people buy into that. It makes them angry. Right. So 
I would suggest yeah. I, I just because like oftentimes he doesn't state a flat out lie. He just rambles absurdities. Um, right. And yeah. so <laughs> yeah. how, how do you fact check someone who just said 50 billion different things that are confusing but they all feel wrong, you know, it's just, yeah. how do you do that? And I think so. I, I, I would, I would recommend the article on bullshit. Um, if you have trouble okay. finding it, I've got it somewhere. Okay. It. Thank okay. you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the first reason it's unstable is because you always have to have the special powers. The second reason it's unstable is because once the person dies, what happens? Right. So there's always the question of succession. And Weber argues generally there's going to be two outcomes to that. Either there's going to be the routinization of the charismatic community or there's going to be the dissolution of the community. And so we can think of like Jonestown, how instead of a succession for Jonestown, there is a complete, you know, they just destroyed themselves. Um you might think of, I'm trying to think, it's hard to like give examples of dissolved charismatic communities because we usually don't talk about them anymore because they're gone. Um, the Shakers during the um, uh, American, uh, what's the word, religious revival is a good example. They died out. They just didn't have many followers. Um, whereas the routinization is the turning the charismatic leadership into either traditional or legal rational. So it's becoming more rational of a community and of an authority structure. So either the person is going to say, for example, um, my son is now going to be king. And this is because God is giving him the power now. So that is turning it into tradition. Or it's going to be saying, let's set up a vote. Right. So this would be something like George Washington handing it over to the rest of he's like, OK, we, I'm only going to be president for one term. That's because I think we need someone who everyone trusts. But then after that, it's going to be up to a vote. So it's turning from the charisma of George Washington into the legal rational system of voting um, a person in. Does that make sense? It does, except for President Putin. <laughs> It doesn't make sense because well, he's doing his own thing. And that's you have to you have to acknowledge illegitimate domination too. So these are only oh, legitimate. Yeah, <laughs> these are only when people accept the authority. Um, and I, I, I it, Weber, at least in what I've read, doesn't talk much about when you know you have a leader who acts like they're legitimate, but then behind the scenes is, is killing everyone. I, I would yeah. imagine that counts as illegitimate authority, right? So, um, it probably is. Yes. And I realize that it is already 6.15. Feel free if you need to drop out. I'm going to keep recording. Um, I, I just want to make sure people don't feel bad, like they have to stay here because you've signed on. How much do you have, Professor? Uh, Ten slides. Okay, I'll keep going as long as I can. Okay. So... I just talked about how when we were talking about domination, we were focused on the individual, usually the an individual or in legal rational, you know, the office. So it's um, maybe one or two people who have the, the, dom the legitimate domination. But let's move into broader conceptions of power. And this is one of the ways that Weber um, tries to uh, complicate Marx. So if you remember last week, I said how everyone responds to Marx. Um, this is one of the ways that he does. Marx grounded everything in economic capital, which um, so like property, material goods, money, and that's how people had influence in society. Weber is going to say that's not true. There's more than one way to have power in society. And he comes up with three. Class status party. So class is what it is essentially what Marx was saying that there is um, a hierarchy in society based on how much um, property or money people have. Um, and so this is the way society, there's, society is grouped along hierarchies of class. You have the richest, you have the poorest, and people in between. 
the second way that there that society's power is distributed is in status. So status is more of like social st- like it's exactly social status um, that honor is a um, people with higher esteem have more power in society. They have more influence. Um, people without social esteem are have less power in society. And so we can think of people who don't necessarily occupy um, social or like political positions or aren't very wealthy, but still might have a say in society. We could think of people like, um, uh, who's an, like the Pope. Um, He's coming from like, he is well respected in the world. Yes, he has a lot of money, but it's less about his money and more like that people love and adore the Pope. Um, I'm trying to think if, if you have any examples before, um, scientists are a good example of people with such status, ex- except for now, you know, um, that half the country <laughs> wants to burn them at the stake. Um, so like there's that, way, but scientists are com- like generally a well-regarded group of individuals. Um, whereas, uh, lawyers are not, lawyers are often not seen as honorable people but they have political influence. So that's when we get into party. Um, party is, is social groupings that aren't necessarily um, political parties, although political parties are a form of this, but it's any social grouping that is looking for political or social influence. So Black Lives Matter is a party. Um, the Cato Institute is a party. The um, John Birch Society is a party. The... Um, the Warren Democrats are a party. Um, does that make sense? So there any, any group that is trying to gain or use political or social influence. And so Weber is saying we can't just look at society and see it grouped by people of economic capital. We have to look at how they're in each society, they may have a preferred form of power right we could we could imagine a society and there have been that the money doesn't matter and the only thing that matters is whether you have honor and if you have honor then you'll be the most powerful person in society and if you don't then you're the least powerful Um, we could we could imagine a society without money or honor and all it is is based on political maneuvering and are you a smart political person right and then you have the most power does that make sense so not only within a certain society do we have to measure class status party but we have to understand what that society or that social domain um, privileges in terms of which power has the most power which like which power is most accepted or um, influential. Okay. Can this change, can that change, um, like maybe at certain periods of time? Yeah. Um, Um, so like which one might have more weight? Yeah. So remember he always wants to locate it based on, um, space and time. And that, that, Mm -hmm. that gives the, that opens the door to things changing based on space and time. So I I would argue that um, in the early, um, like right after America was founded, class was not as important as status. Probably honor was. Right. So it was who had the most status probably. And you're like, after John Adams, it was a lot of political. It was a lot of party, Mm -hmm. right. On whether or not you Mm -hmm. were good at politics and then, you know, eventually we get to today where it's really hard to be involved without some um, power from class um, within mm-hmm. politics. So, yeah, over time, it definitely will change. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. This, I think, I have never taught bureaucracy in this class before, but I, the more I read it, the more I was like, this is so foundational. I, I like... I, Mark or Weber was a genius in how he explained this. Um, So bureaucracy um, for Weber, he is trying to trace a, and locate 
um, the modernization of the West. Um, and in he sees it as an increasingly rational or routinized um, society. And bureaucracy, he argues, is the pinnacle of that rationalization, of that more you know, legal, rational authority, that more rational action. Um, and so bureaucracy is kind of like the ideal type of legal, rational authority. So the three things that he points out at the very beginning of his discussion on bureaucracy is here are three kind of hallmark identifiers. First, a bureaucracy has official duties. These are regular activities required for the purposes of the structure. Um, there are rules for authority, and these rules outline which types of authority officials can use and when and how they can use them. So it will say when the military can go in and do a coup <laughs> versus when they can't, um, when you can arrest someone, when you can't. And then provisions mm -hmm. is the officials who are part of the bureaucracy are paid and funded um, for regular fulfillment of the duties. Um, it is hard to imagine, like often, I, I and I would imagine this is the same for many of you that when you read this, you were like, "Well, of course, this is what bureaucracy is." Weber's the first person to really outline this and say, "This is not normal. <laughs> this is a very unique social structure that we have created and that we are organizing society with." Um, and he actually finds it very dangerous, and we'll get into that in a second. So um, here are some. These are the fundamental like elements of bureaucracy, but now we're going to get in some characteristics. So first, he argues that bureaucracy is unique, rational, and protective. Um, I wanted to point out this quote because I think it's fundamental. Um, bureaucracy is domination through knowledge. Now, remember how we just looked at all the legitimate domination, whether that was obedience to the law, obedience to tradition or obedience to charisma, he is saying that bureaucracy isn't legitimate domination. It is domination through knowledge. So something completely different. So this consists on the one hand, technical, technical knowledge, which is sufficient to ensure the position of power. But in addition, bureaucratic organizations have the tendency to increase their power still further by the knowledge of growing out of experience in the service. So there's not only just knowing about bureaucracy, but knowing all the ins and outs and, you know, the twists and turns. And if um, if Barbara in HR can't get it to me, I know I can go to Kevin, you know, and he'll do this work around. Right. It's all of that expertise and being a part of the system that then anytime they're challenged, they are able to do the work around and find the, you know, the. The, the, they have the know-how of getting things done, even if it's not necessarily the simple explanation of how bureaucracy works. This is, I mean, I honestly, I think one of the reasons I, I agree with Weber, and I think the reason bureaucracy is, um, I, I, I'm trying to say, because bureaucracy is so efficient at this and so hard to enter and understand is one of the ways that it's become one of the foundations of conspiracy theories today, right? The deep state. Well, of course, people are afraid of this thing that no one understands, right? And that exists beyond them and that very few people actually have a great working knowledge of all the interparts and how they all work. Of course, it's going to create conspiracy theories. So I think I think Weber's on to something, especially when we see the next part. So, Professor, yeah, that that um, that to me, um, th this this knowledge uh, part that you're talking about, I was thinking about it in terms of our government bureaucracy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. and the fight that's been going on at least for. 20 or 30 years of my life mm -hmm. where uh, people are fighting to end, uh, to, to limit the amount of time a person can be a senator or yep. be a representative because you might have someone who's been there for 50 or 60 years. And that knowledge that you're talking about and those runarounds and all of that 
I can see that in some of the people who've been there for 30 and 40 years that I've been watching for the last 30 or 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. With what you just said. So yes, um, two things. One, it's a little bit different because those are people who have influence in the bureaucracy, but aren't the bureaucracy. So um, elected officials are not bureaucrats. Elected officials, because they have more of a, uh, they are at, even though, you know, people can buy positions and through money, um, technically they are at the- And gerrymandering. And gerrymandering. And gerrymandering, right. But (laughs) they still have, they still need voters to vote them in. So there is always the option that they may not be there the next term. Bureaucrats aren't like that, right? They are officials who are literally paid to run the system. Like civil servant. They're the civil servant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, You're right in that effective legislators are often people who have this knowledge. So we can think of an Elizabeth Warren, a Nancy Pelosi, um, Joe right. Biden to some extent, right? Even though mm-hmm. I hope he's doing something in the behind the scenes that we don't see. <laughs> right. <laughs> there, there's a question on his effectiveness right now. But so these are the people yeah. who have been there for so long. They know how the system works and they're able to pull the levers on getting the things that they want. When he's talking about officials, though, he's specifically talking about um, civil servants who are hired in the bureaucracy, not elected. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Okay. Okay. So um, bureaucracy, he argues, creates inequality because it creates a hierarchy of knowledge about that bureaucracy. Only people within the bureaucracy are able to have the know-how unless, and he makes this very clear multiple times, unless you have um, so much economic power that you can hire like lawyers, you can hire, um, uh, you can do the revolving door. This is a big complaint of American society right now is that you'll have officials that come into the bureaucracy and then after five years they'll come out and they'll be you know the cfo of a big bank so that they are like hey look at i i learned how to get around this thing we were frustrated about you know so um it creates inequality by hoarding this knowledge and it functions best when political or when public oversight is difficult and we've seen this over and over um and, and remember, I should have mentioned this. I put it in the reading guide, though. Bureaucracy isn't just government. Any kind of gigantic organization is eventually going to run with a bureaucracy, um, Weber argues. And so, so companies have their own bureaucracy. Um, and this is why you have you know, a whole bunch of hearings by um, the legislators in the U.S. trying to hold companies accountable and saying, what is going on behind closed doors, right? We had the whole, fine, after the 2008 financial crisis, there was all the oversight um, hearings. After the um, uh, 2016 election, there were also all the oversight hearings about, you know, Russian intervention or social media bias or things like that. It's, they're trying to get at this knowledge to be able to figure out why are things working the way they're doing and why is everything going wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, and when we, see, there is actually very little, I would say, um, public oversight of the actual functionings of bureaucracy in the government, because most of the time it's behind closed doors and really just for the senators or the representatives. So the U.S. has done a fantastic job of hiding the bureaucracy, you know, and allowing, and that's not to say it does, Many parts don't function well or aren't good things, but it definitely, we see it keeping its working secret and it would take a lot of work for any public, you know, committee or group to really entrench itself and be able to understand its inner workings. Any questions on inequality by knowledge? Okay. So the second thing is that it, while it creates inequality, it claims to level differences with the, with the you know, laudable goal of saying it uh, treats everyone fairly. But um, 
This first point is something that I wrote. Bureaucracy can't function with an understanding of different social histories and possibilities of individuals. Like it has to treat everyone the exact same way, regardless of their background. So, um, and we can think about this and how a lot of, there's the big debate right now on structural racism. And a lot, a lot of, you know, more conservative leaning individuals will say, how can a structure be racist? Um, because they're functioning, they're, they're acting in this bureaucratic mode where, um, no, if you come to me and you're poor, it shouldn't matter whether you've, your eight generations of family are poor and the white people stole your land, you're, you're poor the white person who's just become poor deserves the same amount as you do, right? So it's this leveling of differences, despite any kind of background. It must treat people exactly the same because it's trying to do this mass organization and it just doesn't have the time or capability to process all of these informations or claims or structures and treat everyone individually. So, um, this is where we really see a highlight of bureaucracy as rational and impersonal. So remember when we talk about rationalization and routinization, this is a really great example of how it's unable to treat people as individuals and instead has to treat them impersonally as just, you know, another case that's coming through the system. Does that make sense? It does, but I don't know that that these bureaucracies actually do that though can you explain what you mean well where you were saying that they this first part bureaucracies cannot function with with an understanding of different social histories and possibilities but i think that they do uh, I'm, I'm saying that <clears throat> the argument you just talked about with affirmative action for instance and those kinds of things um it seems to me that they, I don't know how to explain this. I'm going to have to think about it a little more, but there's something about that that seems yeah. like um, I'm I have to think about. It. So just with the case of affirmative action, um, I think one of the interesting things about that is that scholarship has shown that the recipient, like the people who have benefited most from affirmative action are actually white women. Um, right. And so, like, there is still something that it didn't, it didn't help um, people of color like it was supposed to, to the same extent it was supposed to, right? But I think that's, that comes from the inequality by knowledge that you were talking about. Because there, you, you, I think that the, the in, I'm going to call them insiders right now because I don't know what the right term is yeah. for them. But I think that there are people... They know the system, you know, how to make the system work. They even write, I mean, you can write the laws yeah. in, in such a way that they they do what you want them to do, right? You know what I mean? You can write yeah. it that way. I see what you mean. So it's, um, <sighs> trying to see. That this is not to say that um, a bureaucracy cannot be designed to create inequality or designed to um, uh, disprivilege people, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. But it's yeah. hard to, it's, I, I think what he's saying is that bureaucracy cannot privilege people in the sense of it cannot say um, so-and-so had a rougher life let me give him a break. Um, right, it, right, okay. It, it can say, um, so-and-so is black, so they don't get this, they don't qualify. Okay. So I, I, I think that's, and, and, and this is perhaps a really good, like, critique of his bureaucracy. Again, you don't have to, you don't have to agree, and that's fine. Um, and I, I'd be curious as you do read the bureaucracy, if you can like, I, I would, I would highly suggest like highlighting sections like this. We are like, no, let, let's look at this example. Um, and I think that would be okay. Good so practice. highlight sections, okay. Yeah, and say like, ah, eh, I don't think like we'll see how this is, and then we can either, as we discuss it, it's either did 
Weber have it wrong with what bureaucracy is? Is there a new type of bureaucracy we have to identify? Is this an evolution? Yeah. Right. And then we can describe why did Weber get this wrong? Does that make sense? It does. So don't feel afraid to say, uh-uh. Um, okay. That's totally fine. Um, I, I'll always play the devil advocate to try to explain what Weber would say, but even that yeah. could be wrong. So feel free to, you know, ignore what I'm saying. So um, these are, here is the, this is why Weber found it, found, like was really worried about modern society and felt that we were going to get involved in an iron cage. Um, bureaucracy, um, because it was the most efficient way to um, organize massive amounts of people. And I really hope that when you read that you really understand when he talks about mass democracy, because that was, I didn't have time to put it in here, but it's very important um, for understanding this. Because um, he also says that bureaucracy is fundamentally at odds with demo democracy, that bureaucracy is at odds with democracy, right? If there's any kind of hoarding of knowledge, then democracy is unable to happen because democracy happens best when people have knowledge. Um, anyways, in any kind of mass administration, you need the most efficient thing. And so he argues that as society and as population grows, bureaucracy is going to enter into every single field every in social domain, and each domain will become more and more rationalized. So we see this. So it starts in, it starts in economics. We have these corporations. We see it in politics, um, but we also see it in healthcare now. How much money is spent in healthcare on administration and paperwork rather than actual healthcare? We see this in education. We see that, right? So it's, we see this in religion. We see bureaucracy is moving into each of these social domains. And he sees that as problematic because it's revolutionizing what are the norms in each of those domains? What are the values of each of those domains? How do you act in each of those domains? Um, but he definitely is um, predicting bureaucracy's spread into all of the social domains of life. Um, as we talked about, because of the knowledge Bureaucracy is difficult to destroy. First, because it's what makes mass society able to function. And without it, it would be pretty chaotic. Um, two, because it, the amount of knowledge it takes makes it all but impossible to replicate or infiltrate. And three, you, he, he um, evaluates um, political upheavals through time and shows that even when you have a country come in completely dominate another country, they often leave the bureaucracy intact and let it continue its functions. And so even if the politics are overturned, the bureaucracy continues. And we see that in a less extreme way anytime you vote in a Democrat or Republican, right? The bureaucracy is still going. And they might change some of the rules, but the civil servants are still there. They're still filing the same paperwork, right? They're still making the country go. Um, and so this is why he's saying the more we rationalize, the more like society, the more it is caught up in these legal rules, this hidden knowledge, and the less likely we'll be able to break out of this mold, the less likely we will be able to, you know, evolve beyond bureaucracy or challenge it to create a new and different society. Does that make sense? Yes. So the last example of this rationalization is the Protestant ethic. So I, I, I made the really difficult decision to make to not assign this as a reading. Um, this is probably his most foundational work. Um, what most people know Weber is this. Um, the gist of it is in the video I assigned because I, I wanted you to understand that. Um, but it is a very... I feel like it's not worth reading unless you read the whole thing. And I didn't want you to read the whole thing. So I decided to just make it a, a, a short video. Um, How big is it, Professor? What? How big is it? It's good. It's a big, it's a big book. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is like, this is his tome. 
we might say. This is oh, okay. where he put all of and most of his energy. The other big one is the economy and society, which is even bigger. Oof. Um, but uh, yeah. I have it if you want to look at it. Um, but I would recommend waiting until after the class is done and you have more time. Okay. So, um, again, Weber wanted to study the unique motives and rationales for why capitalism took its particular shape in the U.S., um, remember that Marx is arguing a very particular historical movement that you have revolution after revolution of different class struggles. Um, Weber is going to say it's not that that didn't happen. It's not that there wasn't a material basis for capitalism's creation, but that there was also social movements and social changes that influenced a particular kind of capitalism that we see in the West. So he argues that there Professor, were- Professor. Yes. I, I'm sorry, but that, now that is what I was trying to talk, that is what I was trying to say about the Underground Railroad. Like what did that movement do to capitalism? Uh, because I don't think it was considered. I Because it was happening all at the time Marx was talking about what was going on, you right. know, but this thing was happening underneath. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I wonder how it affect, affected what Marx and even what Weber may be thinking about. That is a good question that clearly neither of them answered. So it's up to you um, to answer that question. <laughs> all right well you you might go, go. And, you might see if anyone's talked about uh, i so i would whenever you have questions like this i always think it's fun just to see if anyone's done anything but look up you know yeah. marx capitalism underground railroad on google scholar or weber spirit of capitalism underground railroad see if anything's been done on it because i don't know that's okay. a good question okay um so religiously so Weber is going to say the unique kind of capitalism that developed in the West was that the, as was the development of two fundamental religious doctrines. The first was a calling, um, and this came largely from the Lutheran tradition, that every person has a calling and it is a, a uh, economically oriented task that you are to do in this world. And you will be rewarded materially if you find your calling and complete it. So if you... Um, Essentially, it's a way of uh, like a self-fulfilling like prophecy that those who do well in the economy tell themselves they found their calling. So like if you start a fruit stand and it ends up you're really successful at it, you, you'll say, oh, God clearly called me to be a fruit stand operator, right? Because I'm doing so well at this. Um, and so if you're doing poorly in the economy, you probably haven't yet found your calling is kind of how this was being discussed at the time. Now added on to that was predestination. So God has already chosen those who are going to go to heaven. Yet you cannot, he's not told anyone who's going to heaven. And so one of the ways this developed was since God has given us the way, he has given us the way to know if we are saved based on our calling. If you're working hard in this life and you're predestined, then you will find material success. So it, this is a great spurn to get people out into the economy, right? To be economically productive, to see if they're saved. They want to be working in the world to see if they're saved. And that was how this started, was this idea that you have a calling, so you go out and you want to see if you're saved by working really hard, getting the benefits. And as it evolved, it be, so when it, so I want it, just make sure I never knew what this word meant until I read Weber. Ascetic means um, self-deprivation, right? Like self-sacrifice. It's um, so an ascetic person would be not enjoying material comforts that only be focused on working, that be denying themselves, you know, pleasure and things like that. So as people start focusing on work, on getting the material benefits and they stop they, they don't want to be distracted by other things. And so they really focus just on employment and economic work. Now, remember, 
as we've talked about in other spheres and other domains from social action to authority to bureaucracy, Mar Weber is, is, is arguing that society in the West is increasingly rational. It's becoming increasingly rational, which means they're losing a lot of the um, non-rational motivations for engaging in social action. And even more than that is they're losing value rational motivation. So over time, people, rather than being value rational of I work because God wants this of me, this is, you know, I find value, a religious value in working, it, it becomes ends rational. I work because I want more money to, you know, increase my economic profit, to increase my economic profit. And it just becomes the cycle of continuing um, economic productivity without the religious motivation. So here's some quotes from the book. People are oriented to acquisition as the purpose of life. Acquisition is no longer viewed as a means to the end of satisfying the substantive needs of life. The Puritan wanted to be a person with a vocational calling. We must be. Um, so, and this is from a, a, my last class in which we read Durkheim first, so that doesn't really follow. But as we look at rationalization, this is where he talks about the iron cage. He says, because we have the concern for material goods, it should lie on the shoulders of saints, like a lightweight coat that one can throw off at any time. And what he means by this is because if it's a religious motivation that we are focused on working heavily in the world, at any time, we can shed that religious motivation and we can just exit the economy. We can be like, no, I like as let, let's say I stop believing in God. So I'm like, well, if if this isn't getting me salvation, then I'm going to stop. I'm going to walk away and I'm not going to be a capitalist anymore. But when you rationalize this activity and you no longer have that religious motivation and you've just become routinized into continually working, then it. It says, yet fate allowed this coat to become a steel hard casing, which in other translations is a steel hard cage. Um, and so he's saying that the rationalization of this without any meaning for why we're working this obsessively, we can't escape it. It's become an obsession of the entire society. And it's hard for any of us to really escape that kind of work habit. And that is his fear. This is where he ends um, is this doom and gloom kind of like future of society. Um, but so we see in a lot of Weber this idea that modern, especially Western society, is a process of rationalization, which becomes increasingly hard to change. Um, and so if Weber wanted to solve society, he would be trying to um, find ways of bringing in more values, bringing in more um bringing in less ends rational um, motivations for acting. That would be like his goal for a better society, just because he's worried that we'll become trapped in this one kind of being and it will be hard to escape and there won't be any kind of evolution or progress. Well, Professor, I've, I have never in my life heard of salvation being work. I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that I have ever, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of how I was raised yeah. in terms of, of religion and, and God and salvation and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And while work was certainly something that was respectable and all of those things, it was, I've never, I've never heard it be attached to my salvation. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. I'm going to have to read him differently if I don't think I picked that up. So um, a, a couple things, um, depending on the type of congregation you went to, if you were involved in a largely African-American church, you this might not apply simply because um, uh, African-American Christianity in the U.S. is imbued with a lot it's not the same kind of Protestantism as Europe. Um, so European... But that might help us understand our fellows better. 
because I had no idea that white people was hearing that either. It's not necessarily that it's continuing today, partly because of this rationalization, right? We don't, okay. the religions don't need to um, suggest this anymore because it's been so ingrained in society that everyone's doing it. It's no longer, you know, any kind of religious doctrine because it exists already as part of mainstream society. Um, oh, that, that might be one way Weber um, kind of demonstrates why. I will say growing up in a Mormon household, this very much was a huge thing. Um, and like Mormons are the exemplars of the spirit of capitalism. Um, if you like, there are, if you look up like um, any profiles on Mormonism, they'll always talk yeah. about Mormonism's amazing ability to um, create businessmen and finance leaders and, you know, things yeah. like that. Mitt Romney, right? He, Mitt Romney right. is the pinnacle of Mormonism. Um, right. And right. so it's like the, State of Utah's symbol is a beehive because they believe in, like, the beehive represents industry. The multiplication. Well, industry. So, be, you know, working as hard as a bee. I don't know what the phrase is, you know, um, but like the idea that bees are always. Like a worker bee. A worker bee. It's like a worker bee. So, this Mm -hmm. idea that we need to be worker bees, always working, always creating, always building, always being productive. And that was definitely ingrained in me as a kid. (laughs) So, like when I read Weber, I was like, oh, you know, (laughs) a little bit of like realization. Yeah. Um, But there's like many different strands of, so like big in, um, in a lot of black churches is liberation theology a lot different than you have in white Christian theologies, which it wasn't about that. So you might see well, a little reason, bit different strands. Well, the only reason I bring that up is in, in our present day climate, you will hear a lot of people politically say, well, I can't believe that, let's say the Republicans in this instance, I can't believe they think this way and they talk mm-hmm. about Christianity. But when I think about, or in that they're Christians, right? But when I think about it, the way that you just explained it, that would help me understand because they might not see Christianity or salvation for perhaps in the way that I do coming out of the black church. And so now that makes sense because all the time I'm thinking that we think the same way. And their behavior is so much different than what mine would be. It it always throws me off. Yep. But now I get it. So there's definitely, I, I would say that um, there is a large portion of American Christianity that is based in the economy, um, mm-hmm. being economically productive and without understanding the economic and religious inter, you know, intertwining. <laughs> um, uh huh then it's, it will be a really hard to understand American Christians today. And um, as oh, I wish, I don't know if we get to this, but I, and then when you add the race aspect, so um, beliefs of race, economy, and religion are like so intertwined that we cannot understand the American political system without understanding those three things, I would argue. Right. And how they like intersect. So, but yes, yeah. um, so this is, I, I'm, I'm glad this kind of resonated with you. I, I think it's important to realize that re- both religion and economic pursuits are not divorced from each other. And that's what Weber was trying to say is, to Marx was not, there is no material foundation for society, but it's not just one way. They're definitely correlated with each other. And so uh-huh. religious doctrines can um, mold economic activity and economic activity can mold religious doctrines. So they're, they're, they're intertwined, which I, which again, like I said, Durkheim and Marx try to be very like, this is the way the world works. And they try to give a structure for that. Whereas Weber's like, let's nuance this, you know, this is like really complicated actually. So this is Weber's a little bit, one of the harder ones to do. Um, So hopefully this helped kind of tease out a lot of his stuff. I know it was long, um, but feel free as you work on your um, study, the tables for the study groups, reach out. Let me know if you have questions um, or if like okay. you're having trouble, like finding a specific quote, let me know and I'll help 
make sure we get that so everyone's you know on the same page okay thank you professor thank you so much see you Brittany. nice to see you as well have a good one uh, well you can't see me today but it's still well, good to see well, you well i should say hear you <laughs> yeah we can hear you <laughs> <laughs> have a good one All right. have a good night bye bye bye, bye.